Uh, good afternoon, and thank you for joining us for another segment in the Jane Irrigation Training Series. I'm Richard Rastusha, Vice President of Water Management Solutions, and uh, we have a great program for you guys today. I'm really excited about this, and it's no surprise, right? I'm, I'm usually always excited about our guests, but uh, we have uh, a, kind of a different uh, program today from the standpoint of uh, we've got uh, Wendy Miller from the uh, American Asso Association of Landscape Con uh, <laughs> um, of uh, Landscape Architects with us today, American Society of Landscape Architects. And, um, you know, as I learned more about the association, uh, I was really impressed for a few things. And one, you know, when you go first to their website, uh, they're really bringing to the front of everybody's mind some of the things that we're really having to deal with on a day-to-day -day basis, not just in landscape, but in our, uh, our own ideas and our lives too. You'll see right away that they're addressing water and storm water. They're addressing climate change and resilience. They're addressing Black Lives Matter. They're taking positions on these things and uh, I really applaud them for that. I think that's really uh, brave and I think it's uh, really exciting and good. So uh, as an organization, you know, the ASLA has been around for over a hundred years, uh, representing thousands and thousands of members and it's really a strong uh, asso association and it's really been doing a lot of good for a long time. Now, uh, Wendy, our guest today, she's president of the ASLA right now and uh, what a interesting time to be president of the ASLA. Uh, there's a lot going on. Uh, one thing that I really uh, respect about Wendy and the work she does personally is she spent the last 30 years working on uh, public spaces, things that we all enjoy uh, on a regular basis. And she's been working to make those better for all of us. And, and that's really neat. And I know, uh, Wendy, you've won a uh, North Carolina ASLA President's Award a few years ago for your work. And uh, uh, you've built uh, quite a portfolio of, of work. Uh, so thank you for joining us today and welcome. And uh, really the first question I wanna know is a little bit about you and the work you're doing. So could you kind of tell us a little bit about that, please? Okay, well, thank you for having me, Richard. I really appreciate it. It's fun to be uh, talking about ASLA in any format. But um, yeah, my career really uh, started uh, a little bit in the private sector doing uh, residential, which was very fun. Uh, but I moved into public sector work and have worked for a, um, two of the cities in North Carolina for most of my career. One doing urban design work, which was purely uh, public spaces and uh, looking at lots of uh, issues in the urban area. And then I moved into transportation when I came here to Winston-Salem. And so that just opened my eyes up to a whole new way of thinking about uh, public spaces that affect your lives. I mean, and getting around your mobility as well as the visual impact of that. So um, many years of learning, quite a lot. It's a very engineering intense profession uh, to be in transportation, but uh, it also uh, is such an integral part to everyone's lives. So we, we, over the time that I worked, we were able to really shift the conversation from being very car centric to looking at uh, pedestrian and bicycle facilities, uh, as well as, you know, making spaces accessible and uh, making those connections throughout your community. So uh, it's safer and easier for people to get around. So I love that work. It was a very broad brush uh, and you could do some very specific projects, which also uh, had a lot of creativity to them in terms of gateways and, um, and just site specific kinds of greenways and things that could go through the communities. Right, yes, because first when I hear transportation, I think, you know, like streetscapes around freeways, but you're actually uh, much more involved in things like bicycle paths, pedestrian paths, and ways for people to enjoy that more. Absolutely, right, yeah. yeah. And, you know, it's interesting because there's always a component of, um, of being able to stop and enjoy what you're seeing at, at whatever speed you happen to be going. So if you're on a highway, you're gonna think about the landscape in a very different way than if you're, you know, strolling or if you're riding a bike, and so. Yeah, Great. boy, isn't that true? And you know, if you have those really nice spaces to bike or walk, uh, to work, for example, uh, it's a lot, uh, lot better for our environment, that's for sure. So thanks, thanks for doing that important work. So um, you're doing that work and then uh, you're involved with the ASLA, of course, you've been a member forever, right? And uh, uh, so then you become president. How does that happen, right? I mean, this is a big organization, I think over 15,000 members. Uh, there's a lot of quality members in the ASLA. So how, what do you do? How, how do you do this? 
Yeah, that is interesting. I, uh, I would say that because I was in a, um, an engineering focused uh, aspect of my profession as a registered landscape architect, I did work, uh, I was often the only landscape architect in my, um, in my unit or in my department. So I really needed to be with landscape architects. I needed to find people who were doing similar but different work. And, and just because I knew the creativity and the camaraderie of that. So I got very involved in my state chapter. Um, so all of our states have chapters. There's a, actually a San Diego chapter. You have many in uh, your big state. So California has uh, Sierra and, um, you know, Northern California, Southern California. So it's, uh, it's good. And lots of landscape architects in California. But here in North Carolina, we're all sort of spread out. So uh, it really gave me that um, connection back to the profession. And it was important. So I served there. And before you know it, you know, you go and you show up and someone asks you to do something and you run for office. And work my way up the, um, to be president of my chapter. And then you come and you meet all your uh, co-presidents from the other chapters. And it really was exciting and you could see how to do things differently and what was going on in different parts of the country and just, um, just got hooked, I uh, loved it. And, and I took a little bit of a break, uh, did other things. I also belong to a, uh, a group of landscape architects that do transportation within a transportation research board, but came back to ASLA and served on some of their professional practice networks, as well as uh, uh, public practitioner committees. And again, I think you just you continue to be there and do the things you say you'll do. <laughs> and they think you know, you're, they can rely on you to be uh, a good steward of the, uh, the volunteer work that they need done. So um, yeah, I, I don't have a big splashy career. I wasn't, I'm not a big name designer that does these big beautiful projects you see in the, uh, all over the world, but uh, I'm a good, I'm a good workhorse, I think that's part of it. You know, I like to, um, and, I, and I love people. So I, I, I just love to, um, to get to know other landscape architects and, and everybody that we work with in our products and services. And um, it's just a big family after a while, you know, you all feel like you know each other and it, it it's just enriches my life. So I love it. Yeah, you said something there that really uh, perked up my ears. Uh, you said, do what you say you're going to do. And it sounds easy, right? Uh, but <laughs> I know a lot of people don't even remember they said that they were going to do that, right? So uh, that was, uh, uh, I know we've got uh, some people live tweeting today this, uh, this conversation. I hope, they, uh, I hope they use that one because I think that's, that's a real gem, you know, um, very important. So, um, and then uh, of course, you know, 85% of success is just showing up, right? And, and you did that, but you have to do it in a, in a, uh, in a good manner to uh, actually get to where you are. Now, uh, this is October 16th today. We should have been just getting back. We should be a couple weeks back from the conference in Miami, but uh, that of course was postponed. Um, you know, when people ask me at work, you know, hey, uh, so-and-so is having a virtual conference. Should we participate? Almost everybody's response today is, well, I haven't participated in one yet. So you guys put yours on hold and you're going virtual. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, we, we tried as long as we could to hope for the best, but it was clear sort of midsummer that it was not uh, likely to happen. So we are, we're putting on a virtual conference and it's going to be from November 16th to the 18th. Um, please go to ASLA.org and it, you'll find it on our homepage, the links to that. Um, I'm in the process right now of working on the um, events that will go with that. It's going to be a great three days. Uh, we'll have education sessions as we always do, but our, our second day is going to be something we've never done before because we don't have our typical expo where you would be and we could come and see your products and talk to you. We're having a design day and that will be purely with our, um, our products and service vendors and we'll uh, integrate uh, content for educational purposes. So there'll be uh, four tracks of education based on different aspects of project work. And then we're going to have a live expo essentially where you can go and meet individually with uh, div new manufacturers and have those one-on-one -on -one conversations you would normally have. Um, and then we're going to have some other fun things. We're going to have, you know, a factory tour and some interactive um, virtual experiences. So I think that design day is something I, I can't imagine how that will be. So I'm really looking forward to that. And there'll be fun live events sort of after hours just to um, do that kind of, you know, sort of the hellos and the how is your family that we always do with the people that we see at conferences. But, um, but the education sessions on either day will also be a, a condensed and enriched 
version of what we would have shown. So uh, we're hoping it's going to be fun for everybody. I think, um, you know, everybody's doing these a little differently and I, I'm, you know, we're kind of new to it, but I think it's a vision of where we'll be in the future. We called it revision because we had to kind of re-envision the conference as well as what the future looks like for us. Um, so tune in. And the nice thing is uh, once you register, uh, that's good for, I think, 30 days. You can go back in and see anything you might have missed, which oh, that's, that's one of the things you can't do at a live conference. So it's going to yeah. be really great. Yeah, that's really cool. And the few people I've talked to who have been to live conferences, they really do say they're great. And uh, even uh, as manufacturers, people coming to visit them at the conference, they can see who's coming. They can easily register who is there, right, for follow-up and gather information. It's just so much easier. So uh Anyway, uh, that's, uh, that's great. Uh, we're looking forward to that uh, next month. It's Good. about a month away. So. Good. I hope everybody online today uh, goes and checks that out and joins us there. I think you're going to learn something. It'll yeah. Great. So, and I just want to remind all our viewers, you know, we've got some people that are active in the chat right now, but uh, you can always uh, ask questions uh, uh, to Wendy in the Q&A and in the chat, and I'll pass those on to her uh, when appropriate. Uh, but that's open for you guys to take advantage of. And you know, one thing that we're, you know, the, the, the delay or the virtual conference is due to the uh, pandemic. Um, what's happening in the business world? How is this affecting the landscape architects and their business and, and their world right now? Yeah, we, uh, we've been watching that pretty carefully. I mean, of course, even as an organization, we, we shut down our office and everyone's working remotely. So, of course, everyone is mostly in a remote setting. I mean, some people are moving back into their offices now, but um, I think the blessing for us and perhaps, you know, your, most of the people on your, um, your webinar today is that, you know, our work is outside. So in many places, uh, construction was considered an essential work. So um, I know in, in my state, we were able to keep moving. Uh, I think, you know, obviously some projects have slowed down. Um, you know, municipal and state governments are looking at their budgets carefully. And so things have paused, perhaps. Um, I'm starting to see a few things that I had in the hopper getting a little bit closer to getting back on board. So hopeful that, you know, we're looking, you know, at, at, at bringing things back into at least some clarity of where we're headed, but we've done a survey. So right at the beginning, we did oh. sort of find out, you know, that, you know, 65% of our respondents did see a, a little downward adjustment um, and they expect, you know, to sort of see that go through 2021 and um, some regions are a little better than others. The Midwest and the Northeast uh, experienced more because I think they did have that shutdown of their construction industry for some period of time until um, people could see where things were going. Um, and then, of course, residential, I think, has been doing very well. I mean, I think, as you said earlier, people are seeing their physical space, you know, that that's where they could control their lives and they're there. <laughs> and so they'd like to get outside and they, you know, now see the value of rethinking their yard and their, their landscape and figuring out how to make it more useful as an outdoor living space, frankly. And that's something we're really good at. So um, yeah, I think that uh, at residential and park projects in particular, I think, you know, people are now really valuing uh, their public spaces and their parks. Uh, and I'm finding that even in transportation that um, we're rethinking how the right of way is being used. Uh, you've seen that in some of the bigger cities uh, that they've actually created what they call slow streets or um, even closed streets for dining and exercise. So uh, I think there's lots of things we're now even thinking may change into the future. It's not sure what will, you know, what will still exist this way as we move out of this time period in our lives, but uh, hoping that we get some of the good out of it and uh, see that there needs to be more space for people on urban streets uh, to, to sit maybe and have a cup of coffee or to stroll and have some sort of uh, breathing room there, literally. <laughs> so uh, yeah, so I think that, you know, we're just all reevaluating and, um, and ASLA has been doing that as well because we're providing continuing education. We're doing a free uh, continuing ed every uh, month so that our registrations uh, as professionals that are licensed, we do have a requirement uh, to keep up with our education. And so we're, doing that, we, um, we decided the students were really hurting and uh, they, they really needed our support. So we made student membership free. That's something wow. completely new for us. We, now a quarter of our membership is students. Very wow. exciting. Our future, we're building and we've created a really robust mentorship program. So we wanna take them under our wing because a lot of people lost internships and, and jobs uh, right away. And I think ASLA has really been trying to reach out and support 
um, their members in terms of, you know, uh, networking. And I've actually heard from people that their involvement with ASLA helped them find that next job when they were, you know, maybe let go during the early parts of the pandemic. So I don't know right. how I went too far with all that. If there's anything else you'd like me to elucidate, I'm happy to do that. <laughs> no, that was great. You know, it was interesting. Uh, I was working for a uh, landscape uh, contractor back in 2009, 2010. And back then, you know, when the recession hit, we, you know, literally saw commercial landscapes just dying, you know, people not mm -hmm. wanting to maintain them at all. And we're certainly getting a different feel now than then. And this residential explosion, right? I'm home, I'm going to build my nest nicer. And by the way, I'm around. So it's easier for me to have somebody come by and uh, bid a job and I can keep an eye on the workers when I'm home. And this is, this has really helped. Uh, it's interesting, though, the commercial side. I, I've just seen a couple people mention in the last couple of weeks, uh, you know, some large contractors saying uh, we got a job put on hold. We're, we're starting to see a little few cracks. Uh, uh, I'm curious to see what happens here. And, you know, we've got the winter to get through, but it's good. It's going to be interesting. Yeah, I, I mean, I think that the commercial sector is probably the, the you know, the one It's just, it's unclear whether people are going back into their office settings. And so I, I don't know how that, I mean, obviously there's no crystal ball, but trying to keep an eye on that. And, uh, um, you know, I think there'll be some readaptation and reuse, but, um, you know, people have come to expect that their landscapes look good. I, I mean, I don't know, when I was a college student, uh, I don't think my campus, well, it was pretty nice, but now when you go to a campus, they're just gorgeous, right? I mean, I think people have, everything's just been elevated a notch and I, there's an expectation now. Um, and, and keeping plants alive is quite important. It's an investment, right? You wanna make sure you're irrigating them and making sure that they're not dying. <laughs> right. Right. Yeah. And, uh, and that you're, you know, putting enough labor on them to maintain them. Right. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. That's, yeah. you know, that's a big sell for us too, to make sure that people understand uh, the maintenance requirements of their landscape, not just getting it installed. Yeah. A few years ago, I was visiting with a customer. I said, why'd you pick us? And he said, well, I saw the work you did over at, you know, this resort. I said, uh, do you expect your property to look like that resort? He says, oh, heck no. We're probably paying a third of what they're paying. But you know, so he got the, uh, we do good work, but you know, I can only afford so much labor. And it's really a labor uh, yeah. formula there is a, is a big part of it. Mm -hmm. So, um, uh, so I, we, we do have a, a couple of questions here. One, okay. one person's asking, you know, really, what, what do landscape architects actually do? You know, what is, what is that job? Oh, you know, there's a great little podcast that one of our members started called Everything But the Building. <laughs> so I think that's a great way to describe it, right? I mean, we really, we do the, uh, the uh, analysis of the site, the design, the managing and uh, planning, and, and we don't, and we're looking at how to nurture it into the future, right? So you're, you're, you've got to know your stuff in terms of um, grading, drainage, circulation, layout of, you know, the, the, the hardscape and how it interacts and uh, safety, health, welfare, you know, those are the things that we need to do because we're actually licensed professionals. So, um, and then some people work at a much bigger scale, you know, they'll work at a regional scale or a, a, a large urban park scale. So, uh, you know, it runs the gamut from that sort of small, very highly detailed, uh, you know, meticulous, perfect environment for your, uh, your home to these much more uh, dynamic, large, uh, well-used spaces. So that's it. Everything but the building. I think yeah. that's probably a good way to, to describe it. Yeah. Interesting. And so then do they typically bid their jobs on a, a job basis? Is it an hourly? How, how does that work? Ah, uh, I would say that, you know, in, in many cases, you know, people are part of a, um, a team, a collaborative uh, architecture and engineering and landscape architecture firm. So, uh, you know, a number of architects, I mean, landscape architects work in that so they, they come on board as an actual team, or you might be, uh, you know, in my case, I tend to be a sub-consultant uh, with an engineering firm or another. So, um, you know, I think that it depends on the kind of work that you're doing. Um, you know, you may just work directly with your client or a landscape contractor. I think we, we you know, sort of talked about that a little bit, but it's, uh, you know, having those design build uh, firms, they're very, uh, I think there's a lot of young people that are doing that now. So. Um, you know, it just runs the gamut how you, you might, and I am being embedded in an organization. Sometimes you're just doing policy. So yeah. it's a, it's a whole wide range of, you really have to be, uh, um, dynamic. I learned quite a lot about actually starting a business after I got out of, uh, love that too. You know, what a, 
would have, wish I had another life to do it all over again, right? <laughs> right. Which yeah. sure seems like there's a lot of uh, options to choose. And uh, mm -hmm. so somebody else is asking, you know, how much time does the typical uh, landscape architect spend on irrigation and uh, irrigation design and the, and the hardware for that? Well, interestingly, uh, I personally have not done any of that work, but my daughter is a landscape architect and she does work more in a typical uh, landscape architecture practice. And I think, you know, we talked about this and her, her, her take on it was pretty much what I expected is that you would, you would generally lay out the, uh, the site plan and the planting areas, and then you would work hand in hand with an irrigation specialist, with a, someone who can help you with that design and the implementation of it, because you're never going to be as skilled at that. And, and there's a lot of questions to answer and you want to do it well and you want to do it right. Um, and so I think they often get together quite early in the project to, you know, yeah. sort of see what the requirements are because the planting scheme, you know, will probably be tied as well into what you're doing with your irrigation. Right, right. Yeah. And I think those specialties are really important, right? I think about, you know, maybe some of uh, uh, the people that work at, for instance, the uh, landscape uh, distribution locations. And I think about all the things I know about irrigation that I expect them to know too. And then I go, wow, but they have seed and feed and fertilizers and tools and all these other things. There's a lot. So, mm -hmm. you know, the specialization really uh, makes a lot of sense. Now, do you need, you know, can I just hang a shingle and say I'm a landscape architect or what do you need to do to, to, to get a credential? Right. No, you cannot do that. <laughs> you would go, you would be trained. I mean, you would have an educational um, component. You, uh, there's, there's sort of two ways to go at that. I would say there's undergraduate uh, programs that tend to be four to five years. Um, and then I was a graduate student. So I did an undergraduate program in a different discipline, but I went back and uh, did a, a master's in landscape architecture. So you come out with a, a credentialed degree and then you have to work for a, a, li a licensed landscape architect for a number of years. I think it's a little different, different states, but um, you know, you work under a, a professional and then you take a licensure exam and that's a three day. Well, when I took it, it was a three day exam. Now it's all online and it's quite different, but it's, it's rigorous. It's very rigorous. Uh, it's, it's the thing you never want to have to take again. Right, <laughs> when right. you pass that exam, you are there. Then you've got your license and you can actually call yourself a landscape architect and you can practice uh, landscape architecture. So it's a bit complicated because so state by state, but you know, you have to, you're responsible. I carry professional liability insurance and um, you know, errors and emissions. You are, you're on the line for all of that. So you really have to be sure you know what you're doing. It's a, it is a licensed profession like engineering or uh, architecture because you're designing things that have to be safe for the public. So. Right. Right. Well, that's great. Yeah. So then, um, you know, we talked a little bit about COVID early on. And uh, one thing I heard the other day, or maybe I heard it this morning, that if you're a healthy young person in the United States, you might not have a vaccine until 2022 for you. And so now I think, has this become, are people starting to pick up a specialty of designing a landscape or a uh, uh, outside the building, everything but the building that's focused on uh, uh, you know, proper spacing, distancing, things like that? Is this becoming a thing? Well, I, I think people are highly aware of that now because if you were in the process of doing something, you're rethinking that. You know, I, um, uh, you know if your project actually, uh, you know, a project I have at a, um, at a, re a retirement community, you, you know, those, those folks are, are much more concerned now about how their outdoor spaces and they will interact in them. So I think people are sort of, realizing there needs to be more maybe space for circulation and um, some outside enjoyment. But I think certainly in the, in the transportation realm, um, there is a lot of thought about, you know, how we're going to, you know, make sure that people have enough space and, and maybe permanently in terms of outside seating. And, um, but I, I think even with the construction that goes on, we, we did a little webinar really early on about how you're, you need to be sure your, uh, your contracts are written and be sure that you're protecting the employees that are out there working in the site. So, yeah, I think we're, we're looking at all kinds of different things now because, um, yeah, I think we're, we're entering a new, new space and, and, you know, rightly so, what, you know, what are you going to do to be sure that these places are, are safe in many ways? And, and I know even, you know, at another level that uh, transportation, uh, you know, using mass transportation or shared use transportation, which is becoming very popular, a lot of that stuff, 
you know, it's on hold. I mean, people don't want to get into a subway car or onto a bus necessarily. So, yeah, I think it's just the whole way we do, uh, you know, have, create a space for people to wait for things. It's, it's all different. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. So um, we have a contractor that's watching today and he's saying that he's definitely noticed that uh, there's more a connection today between contractors and designers or architects than there was maybe five years ago. And he wants to know, he's hoping that this is the beginning of a long collaboration. Uh, I'm wondering what uh, the ASLA is doing to help promote this and getting, right? Because there has been that situation where the contractors say, oh, it was designed wrong and the, and the architect says, oh, they installed it wrong. And there's the, uh, there's the opportunity for finger pointing. Uh, it's just been there, but uh, at least this contractor is saying it's getting better and, and, uh, and what can we do to make it better going forward? You know, that's really good to hear, actually. And, and I know from the time before I did this gig, I was actually the vice president of professional practice. And we were working very hard to come up with some additional contracts that were very specific for landscape architects to work with other disciplines. And I think that we were missing that. And, and in a way, I think just creating that culture that we're actually talking about things and we're you know working on those uh together and i think um i see that too with young people in particular that they they don't want to live in a silo they want to work together they they come up through the system uh, of being in school and um, working collaboratively on projects and they actually do like to get out and do design build projects in school now and um, I wish I had had that, you know, to actually get your hands dirty and feel what it's like to get in there and, and lay some, some uh, pavers. Uh, so I think, I think it's a good trend. I, I'm, I'm glad to hear that, actually, because I, I would love to see that the collaborations were better. I think the, the trust that gets built between a landscape architect working with a contractor or working with a planting designer, if that's not your specialty, because not all landscape architects know plants. <laughs> so... Uh, yeah, it's a, it's a great thing. And I worked with engineers and I, I could see that changing myself, that they were opening up, you know, there was a, there was more respect. So, yeah, I mean, we're a, we're a team. That's what I love. We, you know, we want to be a good team. We want to give a good product. Everybody wants it to come out well and, um, and for the client to be happy. Right. And I think this is what we were talking about the other day too, a little bit was that the really successful landscape architects and contractors we know have good relationships with the other side and they're able to collaborate and discuss when there's issues and they have their go-tos and if it's working if the relationship works then it's going to be successful for both so Absolutely. it is good to see it getting getting better i'm glad that uh, this person uh, mentioned that any other good questions out there for me i'm not looking at your chat box but <laughs> oh yeah there's lots right <laughs> Um, and, you know, this kind of, this question goes along with the question I had, too, about um, water conservation mm -hmm. and the ASLA and, you know, how are uh, uh, architects dealing and coping with uh, global warming and climate change right now? So that, that's a big, big question. So uh, anyway. Yeah, absolutely. Well, you know, we have a, a very active government affairs group within our um, professional organization. And you know, part of it is looking at our licensure and uh, working with state issues. And the other part is a federal uh, group that looks at um, developing, um, you know, legislation. And so, you know, we work with the Land and Water Conservation Fund. So at a very large scale, we work uh, on federal legislation, which, you know, is always meant to be better about conservation and, and stormwater management and integrating it better into, you know, working with the Corps of Engineers and so at a very large level, just getting those policies written properly. And, and we do write policies on a, another level that are useful for our um, members in terms of water conservation and zero escape, which is planting in dry locations, um, plant choices. So, so we try and provide them with at least that guidance and the resources to go if that's not their specialty um, to work on it. But, but managing water is just a huge part of what landscape architects do. Uh, you know, that's often the first reason you get called for a project is because people have problems with water. Right. You know, it's too much or it's not enough. So, um, yeah, I think that, uh, you know, looking into the future, water is just going to be more and more of an issue. So uh, obviously conservation is huge. Rain gardens, that's a, that's a subspecialty for a lot of people now is that they look at um, how to, you know, manage water on site. 
not to let any runoff, you know, get into other locations and problems. And um, so, yeah, I, I, I love this little story that I, when I first had a job where I learned about landscape architecture, uh, it was in a campus planning office and the architect uh, was this very funny guy and he had this uh, drawer and he, and he said, here's the secret to everything. And he pulls out this drawer and he pulls out this paper and he goes, he goes water runs downhill. <laughs> And I love that because I tell that story a lot because it was just like, yes, that's, of course, everybody should know that, but you would be surprised right. <laughs> how many yeah. people do not understand gravity and water. But yeah, that's, that's a big part of what we do. And I think, um, you know, maybe that's, that's the one thing that landscape architects do especially well is because we think of it in terms of a very broad system. You know, it's not just channeling the water or moving the water as an engineer might do, but we're actually looking at dispersal and plants and, you know, runoff coefficient and thinking about how to manage water uh, to the best uh, ability for the site and for uh, the plants. And Yeah, and that, uh, that rainwater, stormwater runoff has become such a hot topic in Southern California now, you know, don't let it, don't let it run off the property, right? Right. Why, why waste it? And let's not have to spend the money on dams and trying to ca capture it when you can you can keep it right on your property. And that's, uh, it's, it's really a, a different conversation we're having today than we even had, you know, four or five years ago. And it seems to be accelerating. So it's uh, pretty optimistic about it. Mm -hmm. um, somebody mentioned that there's an ASLA resilient design and climate change panel sponsored by the Northern California ASLA on October 27th. So uh, yeah, <laughs> that's <laughs> you guys right. are on this. That's right. Actually, I'm going to be a part of that. Oh, so right? I will be there. Yes, yes. I probably should have remembered to mention that. Yeah, I, actually, it's uh, your your uh, uh, your congressman, and um, and then uh, there's a woman named Pamela Conrad, and she's she's doing some really interesting work. She's a landscape architect up in the Bay Area, and she's developed a climate uh, change tool. So it's called Pathfinder Two. I'm going to give her a plug here. And you you use it for your site, and it gives you uh, you put in all the factors, you know, how much pavement, what kind of products you're using, um, what your vegetation cover is, and then it gives you a climate positive score, essentially. So you'll, you'll see whether you're 20 years to being climate positive or five, and you can adjust things. So you could go back into your design. It's an amazing thing. I, I encourage you to go look for it. It's, um, it's terrific. She was actually a, a student or a, a fellow with the Landscape Architecture Foundation who got a grant to do this great work. So there's all kinds of things out there. I, there's more than that that I don't even know about. But um, yeah, but I would say we've also got a climate action committee now that started in last year and we're doing these regional workshops because every region's actually got some very specific kinds of issues. And the first one will be in my region about flooding uh, and managing uh, coastal and, uh, you know, salt infiltration into farmlands. And so, yeah, we're, we're very active in looking at climate change and mitigation and dealing with um, how we're going to look in the future because it's not that far away now. Uh, yeah, that's, that's very cool. Thank you for doing that. And um, so here's the thing, though. A lot of people were familiar or are familiar with LEED, right? And LEED mm -hmm. certifications for buildings. Um, your group uh, has uh, embraced that, but kind of gone in a different direction too. the sites initiative, right? Right, right. Absolutely. Well, a number of years ago, I may just pull out my notes just to be sure I get this right. We, uh, we did work uh, very carefully, you know, with the Green Building Council, um, you know, because LEED was very important and it was being used by a lot of people and it's a certification. So, you, you know, you become certified to be a, a LEED certified uh, person, but we developed this uh, sustainable sites initiative and it's a rating system. And so it does very similarly and ties in probably with other tools. Um, you can look at how to make your site more energy efficient, more um, climate positive and, and, um, and you get a, essentially you can get a, a certification that goes with that. And it, it's, uh, it's something we used for our uh, redo of our building uh, when we did the center in, um, Washington, D.C., and um, I think that there are a number of practitioners out there now that are sites certified and are doing it, and I like to tell my students, because I teach every now and then, that that's something they can get right away. You don't have to do that four years of working on our landscape architect. You can study for that test and take it and call yourself a site certified uh, designer, 
So uh, not a landscape architect, but a designer. Right. And it, it makes a big difference because it's sustainability focused. Um, it's looking at all those um, materials and, and how to sustainably source them uh, and use them in a way that's, uh, and it's got all kinds of community benefits as well. Right, right. Well, that's great. So um, has this pressure to save water impacted uh, landscape architects in a big way? Uh, yeah, I think so. And, and certainly I would say in California and the Southwest, you know, everyone's been on this for many more years than in other places. But um, yeah, I, I, I think that it's, it's a real focus of how uh, many, many people do their work. And I, I can't imagine that it, uh, ana doing an analysis of the site for um, your water conservation and, and for your stormwater management and all the issues you have with water, uh, I can't imagine that you wouldn't do that first thing first. Uh, you know, go and tour it and see what the existing conditions are like. And um, yeah, there's actually, I'd love to get a shout out to our past president because Sean Kelly is kind of like uh, the water guru that I know. And he, um, he could tell you every drop of water that drops on a piece of property and how it goes and where it goes. And he, uh, that's, that's a focus of his practice. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, that's awesome to hear. Now, uh, for any uh, landscape architect that's out there today that uh, is thinking about becoming more active with the ASLA or is in the group but not participating that much, do you have any uh, uh, words of wisdom for them or any, any encouragement that you'd like to pass on? Well, uh, you know, I think that that's where, uh, like for me, you're going to find the people that are interested in what you're interested in. They're doing things that you may or may not have heard of or it's where you're going to find that energy and collaboration. Um, you know, the beautiful thing about our conference every year is where we all gather together and, um, and we, you know, we sponsor students. Actually, I just found out today that we did a fundraiser. So we are sponsoring uh, virtually every graduate uh, of last year's programs to be able to attend our virtual conference this year. So that's a very exciting thing. And so I think, you know, once you, you realize what ASLA provides in terms of um, just that educational content that you can't get anywhere else and the support networks. And even within ASLA, I had a professional practice network on transportation. So you're gonna find that subset of people or maybe they're doing um, therapeutic design uh, or they're doing um, sustainable sites and uh, resiliency or they're doing, um, you know, any other, there's just a myriad of practice types that people have. So uh, parks or campus planning. I mean, it's just amazing that there's this, you know, breadth. So if you want to find your people, that's where you're going to find them. And, um, you know, I, I, I think when you leave school, you know, you've got that, that sort of that camaraderie and it just kind of you get into an office or you get into a work environment and you may or may not know another landscape architect. It, it, it gives you the support and energy to keep going and, um, you know, and to, and make changes, you know, because I think, you know, one thing I realized the other day, I was tell young women in particular, like I wish I had is, you know, maybe not, not to get stuck in any one thing, you know, to make a, make a shift, see, you know, see what you can shift your project to or your practice to, to, to open up new parameters and new ways of doing things. It's just, you know, that's what you're going to get from your professional organization. It's going to, give you that enrichment that you can't really quite get anywhere else. Yeah, certainly. I really encourage people to get involved with their organizations, right? The uh, Irrigation Association is something I've been uh, involved with over, you know, the past 20 years and served on that board. In fact, I think uh, I probably uh, have the job I have today. Fortunate to have this job as a result of a relationship through the Irrigation Association with Eric Olson, who, uh, who hired me at James. So uh, that's just, a, you know, a small way that you can benefit, you know, personally. And then there's lots of ways to give to the industry through that. So well, yeah, appreciate that and what you guys are doing. Uh, somebody's asking now, does the ASLA work with other organizations like NALP or the Irrigation Association, you know, and especially in places where they have similar goals for water conservation? You know, I think this year has been a uh, really uh, great uh, time of finding new partnerships. And so, yes, I would say very strongly that we are, um, we have our sister organizations that all sort of have their own focus area with the education or the, um, the licensure of landscape architects. But now we're kind of broadening for STEM reasons. We, you know, we want to be considered a STEM 
uh, discipline. And so we're reaching out to a lot more uh, science and ecology and mm -hmm. other associations. So yes, we do on a regular basis, uh, you know, there's sustainability groups and we partner with them. So I think absolutely. I mean, there's a lot of joint activities and conferences that can be done. And we always have those close relationships because you sponsor our activities and we're all there together and uh, we learn about products and we learn about um, new ways of doing stuff. So it's a natural fit. Yeah, great, great to hear. So we have uh, one last question here that we have time for. And uh, gosh, I'm sorry we didn't get to everybody's questions because there's been a lot. I really appreciate uh, everybody uh, jumping in here. Um, and so this question is, uh, I think, very interesting. And it says, does landscape architects prefer to design for functionality, aesthetics, form, or a combination of all those? Wow. I said sort of form follows function or all those arguments. I, I am not a purist. <laughs> you know, I think that um, ideally, you know, you're able to do all of that. I, I, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a skill and an art and it's a, you know, a science. So it's a very, it's a very interesting profession in that way. And so you're, you're obviously working with a client to make their functional needs come to fruition. But you know, the extra benefit you bring is that you're bringing some beauty and some vision for the future. And um, you know, you're working with a living uh, system. So you're, you know, you have to be able to see three, five, 10 years out. And um, it's, it's kind of magical, frankly. I mean, the people that are really good at it, sometimes you don't even know that the hand of a landscape architect has been there, right? It's just sort of, you know, you're gonna move through the space and you're gonna, um, you're just going to know that it works. And so it's a, it, I, I think, you, you know, you got to do it all, but obviously you got to make sure that it functions properly. You know, you don't want to leave someone with a problem. You know, you don't want to leave them with a, you know, something where there's a, a flooding problem or there's a, you know, that the water isn't draining or whatever. So you got to have your science and your engineering aspects of it down and make sure that, but, you know, picking the material that works right and right plant, right place, making sure you're doing that, looking at natives, you know, trying to, you know, try to educate as well while you're doing that. Uh, it's, it's a, it's a beautiful, it's a beautiful uh, job. I have to say, it's really like, uh, it's magical. Actually, someone told me it's God's work and you're like, oh my gosh, it absolutely kind of feels that way, doesn't it? <laughs> yeah, because yeah, it's never, it's, it changes over time. It's just, yeah. you know, what a great answer to end on. I, I really like that part. So, uh, Wendy, thank you so much for coming out and being uh, together with us today and answering all these questions. I know people really appreciated it. I know I certainly did. And to our viewers out there, thank you so much, you know, spending your lunch hour with us, uh, hearing and educating yourselves. Uh, it helps all of us, right? It helps the industry. It helps all of us together. And I uh, really appreciate you guys taking your time as well. Uh, remember, all our uh, series is on the Jane's USA website, as well as on Google, Spotify, and uh, Apple Podcasts. So just search uh, Irrigation Training or Jane Irrigation Training, and you can find us there. Again, Wendy, thanks so much. I uh, really appreciate uh, your time today. And uh, thanks, everybody. We'll see you next week. We've got uh, Chris Sabarisi from Corona Tools is going to teach us how to sharpen and take care of our tools over the winter. And then uh, we've got... Um, uh, a gentleman out from uh, Master Gardeners in California, uh, Scott Parker, is going to tell us about the Master Gardener program next week. So hopefully we'll see some of you there. Again, Wendy, thank you. Thanks, everybody. We'll see you all soon. Thank you.